Testing one, two. Testing one, two, one, two. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Are we on? There we go. All right, ladies, we're about to begin in 30 seconds. Woo, stand to your feet. If you're in the lobby and you can hear me, come on in. We'll be starting in 27 seconds. 27 seconds, stand to your feet, find your spot. Hostesses, you can come off your post, find your seat. We'll start in just a moment, amen? Everybody ready? How are y'all doing this evening? Who is excited about what God is about to do? Who came expecting something amazing from the Lord tonight? Something we do at the beginning of every service here at Christ Fellowship is we read God's Word. So if you can, can you grab your Bibles for me? Turn to Psalm 100. We are so glad that you're here with us at the North Georgia Revival Women's Conference. It is our honor that you decided to spend your afternoon with us. We have been praying for you. We cannot wait to see what God does in this place. So if you're at Psalm 100, can you do me a huge favor and welcome Pastor Todd Smith as he comes to read the word tonight. He is our lead pastor and we're so thankful for him. You want to get activated, your small group activated, your Sunday school, your deacons, elders, pastors, get on this book. He sat down. Touch three people and tell them, welcome to the North Georgia Women's Conference. All right. Grab your Bibles. Psalm 100. I'm so honored to be able to share this platform with Pastor Jill Mathis, Pastor Christina Allen, and Pastor Karen Smith as they're gonna open up the Word of God today. And we'll introduce them a little more formally in a moment. The Bible says in Psalm 100 verse one, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Uh -huh. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. And know that the Lord, that he is God, and it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Come on, give the Lord a clap. Come on, give him a shout of praise tonight. Jesus, we love you. There's nobody like you. There's nobody like you.
Thank you. 
both of your hands. Just lift both of your hands. I was praying this afternoon and I said, God, what, what do these ladies need to know about you? And he said, tell them I'll never leave them and I'll never forsake them. Some of us have been in a hard season where we're fighting and we're trying to fight in our own strength. And the great thing about God is we can just lay right back against him and he goes before us and he fights every battle. He fights every battle on our behalf. We can rest in the power of who he is, our defender, our victory, our conquering king. All we have to do is praise him. All we have to do is worship him. All we have to do is tell him how much we need him. So just in your own words, just for a few seconds, can you just praise him? Can you just tell him how much you love him? Tell him how much you need him? That's how you fight your battle. That's how you fight your battle. You praise him before you get the answer. You tell him thank you before you know what's to come. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for what you did for us. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you never leave us. You never forsake us. We fight our battle through praise, Lord. We lay down all of our weapons at your feet, and we raise our hands, and we say, thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's just no way. today because of three things you honor Jesus 
You believe Jesus and he is not familiar. He has not become just common to us. And those were the three things in the Word of God that tell us that stopped his miracles and his moves was unbelief, dishonor, and he had just become common. Well, in this house among these women, he is not common. And he is honorable. And he is trustworthy. So we believe him today. Amen? Glory to God. Let's take a seat. Let's take a seat and get ready for the word this afternoon. So glad to see you. You guys are so hungry. And hunger pulls. Amen? Hunger receives. And that's what's going to happen today in the house. So find your way. Grab your Bibles. Grab a pen. Grab a pad. Something to write some things down. The Lord's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to all of us. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the conference. Thank you so much for being here. If you are out of state, you are not from Georgia, raise your hand. All out-of-staters, real big, wave it to me. Out-of-state. So good to have you. If you drove over 100 miles, maybe you're in Georgia, and you drove right at 100 or so miles, wave at me. All right. So good to have you this afternoon. Well, ladies, we're about to begin our first session of our conference. There'll be another session following this. There'll be a dinner uh, served, the light dinner prepared and served for us. Pastor Marty Derricott, our executive pastor here, Christ Fellowship Church, will give you instructions about that when the time comes. But we want to get right into the Word at this time. Cody, can you uh, move the podium for us? Cody, if you'll do that for us, it's right over here. So he makes that ready for us. Uh, I have the privilege of introducing our first speaker this afternoon. Now, uh, Pastor Todd is my husband, and we've heard this gal at least do some charges or two. I don't know that I've actually heard her preach. But the first time we heard uh, Pastor Jill Mathis, uh, she spoke and gave a charge. Todd looked at me and he went. And then he told her husband, Pastor Robert, you better watch out. She is a fireball. And so we are privileged to have her as our first guest speaker uh, this afternoon. This is Pastor Jill Mathis from Freedom Tabernacle. Her husband and her, uh, Pastor Robbie Mathis, they pastor that wonderful church, Freedom Tabernacle, who have been a big part of the North Georgia revival. So stand up and give a round of applause for Pastor Jill Mathis from Freedom Tabernacle. Well, hallelujah. If you can't preach in this atmosphere, you don't preach. Amen. I don't know about you. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. But I'm not going to let anything steal my hallelujah. You know what? Sometimes we just got to make a choice, don't we? No circumstance, no person, no devil in hell is going to steal my hallelujah. God gave that to me, and I'm going to give it right back to him. So if you're fighting a battle, that's a good place to start today. You give him praise. You give him your hallelujah. Doesn't matter what the circumstance looks like, because he's got that. You give that back to him, amen? amen? I am so excited to be in this house today. Um, wow, wow, wow. Thank you guys for being here. This is awesome. And um, I don't have much time, so I'm going to be quick. Now, I know that makes you nervous, because every time a preacher says they're going to be quick, they never are, are they? <laughs> that's, that's when a preacher lies, is when they said they're going to be quick. But I, they're going to cut me off at 410, so I promise you I'm going to be fast. But I do want to take a moment, and I want to honor Pastor Todd and Karen Smith, and I want to honor the leadership of this house. Yes, please. You have no idea, and I really have no idea the price that Christ Fellowship Church is paying to host the presence of God and to host this revival and to open themselves up to let us come and be a part of what God is doing in this place. It is a large, large price that they're paying and sacrifice, so thank you so much. Uh, we just honor all of you guys, and um, I am so honored to stand in this place. I honor this platform. It is uh, just a huge, a huge uh, opportunity and blessing for me to be here, and I take that seriously. And I also want to thank all my sisters from Freedom Tabernacle, my girls who are supporting me, 
I know y'all been praying for me and, and loving on me and encouraging me. And um, I just want y'all to know I would not be the woman of God today that I am without each and every one of you and what you've poured into my life. So I thank you for that. Amen. Well, I'm just going to jump right into uh, what the Lord gave me for today. And I just want to say when we started talking about having this conference, the Lord immediately put something in my spirit. And so um, I knew whenever they asked me to speak, you know, sort of where we were headed. And the thought that he put on my heart was about being a carrier of the glory of God. How to maintain the glory of God. The glory of God is in this house, amen? And it is good to come and experience his glory with his people. But there's something about being able to take that glory with us. Be able to take it into our day-to-day lives. So it's one thing to come to church and experience God, but it's another thing to take the God of church with you to your homes, to your families, to your workplaces. So that's really uh, what God has stirred up in my spirit for today, is just talking to you ladies and encouraging you, how can we maintain the glory and the presence of God in our life from day to day as we, as we go on? So um, I just want to take a moment and, and sort of clarify what I mean by the glory of God, because I know all of us have come from different backgrounds and different places, and some of us may be you know, live in a spirit-filled life, and some of us, this, this may be new. So I just want to take a moment and tell you what I mean when I'm talking about the glory of God. So in the Old Testament, the glory is called the kabod, the kabod of God. And that, the definition of kabod, now listen to this, it's so rich. The definition of kabod means weight or weighty. It means splendor, copiousness. Something's copious is overflowing. The glory honor, power, wealth, magnificence, fame, dignity, riches, and excellence. Wow, isn't that good? I think sometimes things get lost in translation. When we're going from the Greek or the Hebrew into the English language, we lose a lot of the richness of the words. So there's so much contained in God's glory, and we want to learn how to tap into his glory and how to really make that a part of our everyday lives. So I love this. Kabod is God's visible splendor. I don't know about you, but I want that in my life. I want his visible splendor. Day in and day out, I want my children to see it. I want my husband to know it. I want the the people in my workplace. I want to walk into an atmosphere and it change because God has entered the room. Don't you? Don't you want to... We can, ladies. We can. We can carry that power. He wants that for us. So um, that's sort of what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the glory of God as I speak to you today. And then once we know what the glory is, the next question begs, who's it for? Who is the glory of God for, right? Um, And I believe that many of us aren't so sure that the glory and the splendor and the excellence of God is necessarily for us. You know? I think we look at other people and say, gosh, I wish I could walk in God's glory like she does. Or I wish I had the presence of God in my life like that person. I wish I was close to God like him. Have you ever looked at somebody and felt that way? Somebody who you just felt like was so super spiritual maybe? But you know what? God God has a plan for all of us. I've got good news for you. We're going to go to the Word and see what he says about that. I know that I've been guilty at times of thinking that others had maybe some special measure, that God's really given them a special measure of his glory or his presence. Um, But that's not what the word tells us. So I want you to go to Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. The word tells us who the glory is for. Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. The word says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. So the word tells us right here, this is talking about Israel, but we are spiritual Israel, those of us who are his people. The glory of the Lord is risen upon us, he says. Amen? Then look at Isaiah 43, 7. This is awesome. I had never seen this before exactly this way. The Bible says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. 
Everyone that's called by his name, I'm called by his name, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower. I was created for his glory. So let me tell you, ladies, there is more. Amen. Does anybody need more? Yes. More's good, isn't it? Yes. I mean, what we got's okay, but there's more. There's more. And I believe that he is calling us to that place of more. He wants to give us more of himself. Now, I think it's interesting here, the Holy Spirit pointed out to me, the word doesn't say that we were, it doesn't say right here in the word that we were created to give him glory. Now, we were created to give him glory. There are times in our lives we come down and we raise our hands and we praise him and we thank him for being the giver of all good gifts. We give him the glory for the things in our lives that he has done. But right here it says that we were created for his glory or to receive his glory. Some of us never get to that place. We give God glory and, they, and we think that's all we're supposed to do. But the Bible tells us here we were created for his glory. We were created to live in his glory, in his manifest presence, so that we can go deeper and further with God. Amen? I don't know about you, but I know I need more. I want to live in his glory. All right, so... What better way to give him glory than to die to ourselves and to allow him to fill us with himself and be Jesus everywhere that we go? We are giving him glory whenever we walk in his glory, when we allow him to fill us with himself. So I encourage you to ask the Lord how and if and when and where you need to go deeper with him because we're all called to manifest him. He wants us to manifest him to the world. Pastor Todd's already said it. He's done the work. He sat down. His work is finished. Now he's commissioned us through the power of the Holy Spirit to take Jesus to everybody that we know. And we can't do that if we don't have him inside of us, filling us up, giving us something to take. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Okay, so quickly, um, that was just a little introduction. There was, whenever God laid this on my heart to talk about his glory, there was a scripture that he sort of dropped in my spirit. And so what I want to do is just uh, very quickly sort of run through that. And then what I really want to get to is I just want to share with you guys uh, some of my testimony today. That's really what God's put on my heart for this particular time. So um, very quickly, I want to look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Because this is the scripture that God gave me to go along with this learning how to be a carrier of his glory, okay? So let's read it. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the, excuse me, I lost my place, and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Amen? Amen. So verse 3, and verses 3 and 4 are kind of the key verses here that God really dropped in my spirit. The author asks a question. He says, who can ascend into the Lord's presence, or who can stand in his holiness. And we've already talked about the who, but really what he's saying is, how do we get into the Lord's presence? How do we ascend the hill of the Lord? We all have the potential, but how do we get there? How do we get to that place of residing and living in the presence of the Lord, day in and day out, abiding with him? So that's the question. And then in verse 4, he turns around and he answers that question. And he gives us four ways, four ways, four um, requirements, so to speak, that we have to line our lives up with if we're really going to be in that abiding place with the Lord. The first requirement is clean hands. So clean hands is talking about living a lifestyle that's free from sin. Not walking in willful, continuous sin. Not walking in disobedience, but knowing that we have to die to our flesh that we have to dial to those lusts that are inside of us 
and we have to lay our lives down so that we can live a life that's pure and holy. It's a requirement. We can come into his presence and out of his presence with sin in our life. We can step in a place like this and feel the presence of God even if we're living in sin. But if we're going to maintain the glory of God, if we're going to carry his glory, we have to clean ourselves up. We have to have clean hands. Amen. It's maturing. It's maturing to a place where we hear and obey the voice of God. Holy Spirit said to me, we can't any longer have the mindset of towing the line and seeing how close that we can get to sin. Well, I'm going to hang around. I'm going to get close. I'm going to tow the line, but I'm not technically guilty, right? You ever, you ever known anybody like that? You ever been somebody like that? Just towing the line. I'm going to see how close I can get, but I didn't really do it. I didn't really participate, so I'm not really guilty. And Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. It's about becoming so sensitive to God's spirit and presence that we don't want to be near anything that would even give the appearance of sin. See that? It's a, it's a whole shift in our mindset. Lord, I don't even want to be near that if somebody's, if it's going to give the appearance of sin, if it might grieve your spirit. I don't want to be near that. I need my hands to be clean if I want to ascend to the hill of the Lord, if I want to be in your presence. So we've got to have clean hands. It's really as simple as this. God can't abide with sin. We know that. Remember Jesus on the cross when the Father forsook him? He had to look away because of the sin that had been placed on him. God can't abide with sin. So if we are carrying sin, we can't abide with God. Amen? Again, we can come in and out of his presence, but if we're going to abide, that word abide means be married to. It's an intimate word. If we're really going to abide, if we're going to carry his glory and manifest his presence, we, ca we can't have uh, dirty hands. We have, to, we have to have clean hands. We have to have clean hands. The second thing the author tells us is that we need a pure heart. And a pure heart is a pure motive. Pure means clean, clear, unpolluted, uncontaminated, and untainted. So if we want to ascend higher into the presence of the Lord, ladies, we have to have a clean heart and a pure motive. And this is harder than it sounds. It's harder than it sounds. Whenever we really start looking at our motives, why we do what we do, why we say what we say, how we treat people, we're going to find that our flesh has a lot of ulterior motives. I mean, I don't know about you, but my flesh has a lot of ulterior motives. I want what I want, when I want it, and I tend to think that I deserve it. Amen. Can I get a witness? Does anybody like their way in this house? Our flesh likes to get our way. We want people to act a certain way. We want them to do a certain thing. But if we're going to live in the presence of the Lord, we have to learn how to have a pure heart. So the Lord gave me just a few things, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I wrote down the first five or six that came to mind, and I just want you to listen to Holy Spirit as I read over this list and ask him, Lord, is there any of that going on in me? What do you need to purify in my heart? And he will speak to you. So the first thing that we need to get rid of is selfishness, which we just talked about, right? Wanting what we want, when we want it. Secondly, he said, get rid of offense. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have time to preach that. Are you kidding me? Oh, my goodness. Offense will kill the Spirit of God. You cannot have offense with man and expect to be in union with God. Amen. Not going to happen. The third thing, you've got to get rid of unforgiveness. Not optional. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, the Bible says if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. I didn't say that. He said that. You cannot walk in unforgiveness and think that you're, that you're going to maintain the glory of God in your life. So if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, let me just say, get it right tonight. See, the great thing is, is we can repent and our slate can be wiped clean like that, ladies. So once we have revelation, once we have conviction, all we have to do is come to God with it and lay it down. And we can start fresh and new. We can ascend right back into his presence. We have to get rid of, I hate to say it, manipulation and control. I know, I hate to say it because we were all doing good until we got there. Manipulation and control. Making sure that other, people's act, pe other people act the way we want them to. 
that they say what we want, that they do what we want, and finding ways to push and control until we get what we want. We won't live in his presence with manipulation and control as our heart motives. We also need to get rid of angerness and bitterness. And I just want to say that Holy Spirit told me that we could be doing good with all of these other things, and we could be doing good with everybody in our life, but have one relationship where we're hanging on to bitterness, anger, and that will still be a thing that will keep us from maintaining His glory. We've got to search our hearts. We've got to search our hearts and make sure everywhere, everywhere our heart motives are pure. And then pride was the other one. I'll give a quick example of the reason that this is so difficult. This may or may not have happened at my house this week. I'm just saying, don't judge me. But ladies, have you ever been running around like a chicken with your head cut off, cleaning up supper, helping the kids with homework, doing laundry, taking out the trash? Come on, does, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, you're busy. You're busy. And finally, you look at your husband and you say, would you take this trash out right this second? I can't take it one more moment. Now. It's probably not that the trash is about to overtake your home and everybody's going to die, that you want him to take that out. It's probably because he's been sitting on his duff watching football for two hours and you're about to die because you've got so many things going. You hear what I'm saying? But really, if we search the motive of our heart, that, that's not a pure motive. And that's a little bitty thing. It's a little bitty thing. But it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. So we have to be very careful, even in the little things, that we purify our motives. You know what? It would be much better if I went over and I sat down and I said, dear, I'm about to go crazy because you're not doing anything. And I need you to get up and help me. Yeah? And you know what he'll say? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't realize you needed my help. Because he's clueless. He's not trying to make you mad. He just has no idea, ladies. He, he has no idea. So I'm telling you, this is harder than you think. Because even the little things, let's purify our motives so that, we can, so that we can live in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit told me to purify our hearts. It'll take prayer. It'll take intentionality. It'll take humility. And it'll take conviction because we don't change without the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So listen when he convicts. Don't run from it. It's a good thing. Listen. The third thing, now I was happy to start right there, because honestly when God dropped this in my spirit, I heard, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so I was like, okay, cool. Well, when I actually started studying the scripture and read it, it turns out there's more. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess I have to preach the whole thing. So when we go on to the third thing that he says, it says the person who's not lifted up his soul to an idol. And isn't that just like God? Because then I remembered in my testimony that I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes, a very, very key thing that happens in my testimony has to do with an idol and what God spoke to me about my idol. So we're going to address the idol in just a moment. I just thought, Lord, you just snuck that in on me, didn't you? You snuck that in on me. He did tell me this. An idol is not necessarily what we've always thought of as a little carved image or a little, you know, picture that somebody worships. He said this, an idol is anything or anyone that steals your attention, your time, or your affection. So we'll deal with idols later. The last thing that he showed me in that scripture the next thing that he says that will keep us from ascending the hill of the Lord, he says, the person who swears deceitfully. So I, just very quickly, because I could spend a whole sermon on this, it is so important, ladies, that we aren't deceitful or manipulative or controlling or untruthful in how we talk. Because if we are any of those things in our speech, it will keep us from being a carrier of the glory of God. We have to speak the truth in love. Y'all know life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I can't talk like the world. I can't talk like the devil and then expect to ascend into God's presence. It's just not going to happen. So if I want to be in the presence of the Lord, I better line this up with what he says. 
Line this up with what he says. And if you're not sure, that's where you start. If you can't find something nice to say, you just say what the word says. Because then you know you're in line with him. Amen. So it's so important. So I hope that just this little tidbit of information will just sort of encourage you and spur you. Go to this scripture. Ask the Lord, Father, what, what may be keeping me from abiding in your presence? Show me. You know, and just ask him. Because if you show him, if you ask him, he will show you. The great thing is, is he's inviting us to come up. He wants to give us more. And so if we'll ask him, he'll be faithful um, to show us what he wants to do. And I just want to encourage all of you. We are being changed from glory to glory, ladies. You know, it's easy to look around and compare ourselves to other people, like I said, who we think are more spiritual or who have arrived in some way. But every day, our walk is about day by day, month by month, year by year, just becoming more like Jesus. Okay, so I encourage you. Glory is not an end point. It's not some place that we eventually arrive to. Oh, finally, I've, I've, I've become spiritual. I'm in the glory of God. No, no, no. We don't arrive. You know why? Because he is limitless. He is eternal. So no matter where you are in your walk, whether you walk in a great measure of his glory or you're just learning today that there is a glory, let me encourage you, there is always more because he is limitless. He is eternal. And the last thing I want to say about glory, God spoke this in my spirit in the last year or two. Glory is not a place. It's not um, the top of the hill like our, you know, who will ascend to the top of the hill. Glory is not a place. Glory is a person. Glory is him. It is Jesus. So if we'll just keep our eyes fixed on him and fall in love with him, all these other things will begin to line up. And if they don't, he'll, he'll show us. He'll convict us. He'll say, come on, come on, let's deal with this so you can come up a little higher so that you can be changed into my image. Because ultimately, that's what we want. It's not about looking spiritual. It's about being more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you just to put down your pens and your notebooks. I've got about 10, 12 minutes. And I want to share with you guys the key that allowed me to begin to come into this glory. The key in my life for experiencing the glory of God and then learning how to maintain the glory of God in my life. And so I just want to share with you guys a little bit about that. A brief history, I was raised in a great Christian home. Um, my parents loved me. They took me to church. You know, I had a good childhood. I was a pretty good girl. Like, no complaints growing up. And I know a lot of people don't have that testimony, so I'm very thankful for that. But, you know, I grew up going to a Baptist church, and, and, and I learned about Jesus. And so, all was good. I married my sweet husband. A lot of you know Pastor Robbie. I married him in August of 1996. And in October of 1996, he and I started pastoring a Baptist church. And they were precious people. You know, they really took care of us because we were just babies. We didn't know what we were doing. But come to find out, over the next couple of years, Robbie really began seeking more of God. He just had this hunger and this longing inside of him to know God more. He knew he was pastoring. He was, you know, he was doing what he was called to do. But yet there was a void. There was something missing. And so he began seeking more of the presence of God. Well, we're newly married, and he tells me nothing. So I don't know this. I have no idea. But we, uh, we got, we've got some friends and some family who wanted us to go on a retreat. So, uh, so we signed up to go on this retreat. And he went, uh, it was men one week and women the other week. And so Robbie went on this ret retreat, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost while he was there. Some of you guys have heard his testimony about getting filled with the Holy Spirit. So he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he came home to me, I knew something had happened. Like, he didn't come home and say, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, because he probably didn't even know to call it that. Maybe he did. But I knew something had happened. He was on a new level with God. He was on fire with God. And I just remember that whole week as he came home and the week unfolded, my cry was, Lord, we're unequally yoked. I mean, I saw it. He was about to take off with God. And here I was. And I said, Lord, you've got to do something in me. And so that was my prayer. My hands were clean. I wasn't living in sin. And my heart was pure. I just said, God, 
you've got it. And nobody in the whole world knew that I was praying this prayer. Nobody in the whole world knew what was going on inside of me, but I was scared. I was scared. So I said, Lord, I don't know, but you got to do something in me. So I went on this weekend, and of course, God began to draw me to himself. I really didn't know anybody there. Um, I heard worship music for the first time in my life, and I'm looking around, I'm like, nobody knows me. This is kind of cool. So the Spirit of God just started drawing me to himself, and I started closing my eyes and listening to the words and raising my hands, and my heart just started opening up. I went with an open mind and an open heart, just praying that prayer, Lord, do something, do something to me. I didn't even know what to call it, y'all. I knew nothing. I was a little Baptist girl, and I literally knew nothing. But I knew, I knew that I needed something. I knew that I needed more of God. And as God usually does, he put a precious lady at the table beside me and on the bus ride up there who was like, Jesus freak. <laughs> and I'm thinking, seriously, Lord, like, why is she here? She's obviously doesn't need this. Uh, so I'm like, great. Hooked up with the holy roller here. I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, that's God, isn't it? That's God. But that sweet lady, and I didn't know it, but she began to love on me and minister to me and just befriend me. Um, throughout the weekend, we spent a lot of time together. So fast forward, Saturday night, and we're in the chapel having a church service, and people have been getting set free and delivered, and everybody's happy and jumping up and down and having a great time, except for this girl. Because that day, God had told me that my husband was my idol. And I didn't know what to do with that, but I knew it wasn't good. Now, it wasn't that I worshipped the ground that Robbie walked on, but I was looking to him and his spirituality and his walk with the Lord to be enough for both of us. I felt like, okay, he's got it together, and I love him, and I love Jesus, and it's going to be okay. So God convicted me. And I sat in that service so heavy and so broken. And finally one of the leaders came over to me and I just confessed, you know, what I was feeling. And I had this little paper heart. And he said, write his name on that heart. He's your idol. Write his name on your heart. So I wrote him on the, I wrote Robbie's name on that heart. And there was a cross in the room. And he said, now you go nail that to the cross. You go put your husband on that cross and you let... Jesus be your number one. So I did. I nailed him to that cross, and I could feel chains breaking. And then I turned around to hug my friend. And when she put her arms around me, she began to pray in the Spirit. And the Spirit of God came over me. <laughs> It was literally like liquid love was being poured through me. And I literally laid in her arms like a baby. And the Spirit of God was coming over me and out my mouth. I was wailing. I was moaning. I was crying. Y'all, I had never seen this. I had never heard this. No one had ever told me that it was possible. But in that moment, God met me. And he answered the cry of my heart for more. He did that for me because he is faithful and because he wants to give us himself. After about 10 minutes, they laid me on the floor, and I'm certain I laid there for over an hour. I was shaking under the power of God, the waves just crashing over me. Ladies, I was the second person I ever heard speak in tongues. Hello. I'm, I'm not even kidding you. I'm laying in the floor. And I was like, I'm going to go home and ask my husband if we believe in this. What am I supposed to do with this? 
And every time we'd get in that chapel and the Spirit, God would start moving. It would come, it would come, it would come. But God knew he arrested me. He arrested me. He wrecked me that day. He is so good and he is so, so faithful. Now, I'm telling you, I had no clue of the lingo. I had no clue of anything. But all I knew is that God had met me and that everything has changed. Why do we need the Holy Spirit in our life? Because he changes everything. He changes everything. Literally, if you allow him, he will change everything. That thing you've been struggling with, that thing that you just can't get over, that thing that you can't get past, that thing that you can't get victory over, he will change it. So just quickly as I finish up, it was just amazing because nobody told me to go home and change. But suddenly I've, I've changed the radio. I was listening to Christian music because it's all I wanted. When I read the book, it's like my denominational glasses fell off. When I read the Bible, I was like, oh, this is in here? All about the power and the Spirit of God? What? The words jumped off the pages. It changed the trajectory of my marriage. It changed the trajectory of my family because my children who weren't born yet were going to be raised knowing the Spirit and the power of God. Hello? It changed our ministry. Freedom Tabernacle was born after that happened. It changed generations to come, not just for me, but for my children, my children's children, and for generations to come, the power of the Holy Spirit. So for me, the key to walking in the presence and the glory of God and maintaining starts with, I have to be full of Him. And the great news is we don't just get baptized in the Holy Spirit once. We learn that we have to come back. Let me tell you, I was hooked. That was almost 21 years ago, and I keep coming back for more. I got to get filled and refilled and refilled more of God, learning how to really come into His presence and how to live there. We don't arrive, ladies. We always need more of his glory. So I just want to encourage you, ladies. Some of you are like me and you had no clue. Maybe you're here. You've never been in a meeting like this. You didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. But tonight could be your night. Some of you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit for the first time at this service. God has set this time apart to meet with his girls. And he is calling some of you to come and get filled with the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, to manifest his presence in your life. Some of you have been filled, but you've left your first love. Because the world, because life, because circumstances, because people, because busyness, because whatever gets in our way and keeps us from coming back and saying, Lord, fill me. Fill me with yourself again. I've got to have it. So some of you need to be refilled with his presence. The last thing I want to say, and we're not going to have ministry time now. We're going to wait and save the ministry time for um, this evening after, during the 6 o'clock service. So just listen to the Spirit of God. And if he's saying that's you, that's you, you need to go, whether you need to come up for ministry or in the baptistry. Um, if that's the desire of your heart is to be filled with God and baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you will ask, he will give. Yes. He will give. So I just want to... I want to end with this. John Collier is a a pastor friend of ours, and he told us once that he was praying this really, I mean, he had been seeking God, seeking God for days and days, and he was praying a prayer, Lord, give me your glory. I want your glory like the Catherine Kuhlmans. Like, I want the glory, you know, of these people who have really walked in the power and the glory of God. And that was John's prayer, Lord, I want your glory like that. And you know what God told him? This is profound. God said, I didn't give them my glory. They came and got it. They came and got it. Stand to your feet with me. I want to encourage you to run hard and fast after God because he is in this place and he wants to meet you. And if you will come and get his glory, you can have it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we were made for your glory, not just to give you glory, but to receive your glory. And I pray that you'll stir up a desire in each one of us, Lord, to be uh, carriers of your glory, to walk in your glory and your goodness. Lord, call us to yourself. And I thank you, Father, that when we ask, you are faithful to give. And so we are coming hard and fast after you, Jesus. And we receive your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give.
give Pastor Jill Mathis from Freedom Tabernacle a round of appreciation for the word. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jill, so much. Guys, we are going to take a 15-minute break, okay? So at 425, you need to be back in your seat for session two. I mean, we're going like this today, all right? Restrooms are right out here. There's extra restrooms. You'll see the signage. So if you need to take a break, get a, a water break. There's water fountains out here. Take a 15-minute break. See you back at 425 sharp, okay? 425.